Okay, we're going through, uh, yeah, study through Ephesians. We've got Ephesians chapter 2 today. I've got my four sections. Um, I'll just put them up there so you can kind of, kind of see. Um, there's a lot of clicking that I have to do if I don't put them all up there straight away, so I'm just going to have them like that. But So for, uh, section 1, by grace through faith, verses 1 to 10. Uh, section 2, brought near by his blood, verses 11 through uh, 13. Um, Christ, our peace, is section 3, 14 to 18. And section 4, Christ... Our cornerstone, verses 19 to 22. So we're going to go through this. I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 10, um, and we're just going to dive straight in, okay? Ephesians chapter 2. Um, and how you have he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we have... We all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and have raised us together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus." That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace ye are saved through faith, and not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Not of, not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 10, here, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God have, have before ordained that we should walk in them. Okay. There is a lot. Ephesians, phenomenal book. Spent a long time studying this, spent a long time reading through it, and just, it, it blows my mind every time, because I keep thinking, man, why did we choose to do Ephesians again? And you read it, and you're like, that's why, it's just gold. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of truth, obviously, otherwise it wouldn't be in the Bible, but it's just a great reminder of who God is and what he's done for us. Um, so, we're going to go through it again, um, verses 1 through 10. So, verse 1, and he have quickened, and you have he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. So, basically, we, are, we were all dead. We were all dead. Uh, in our trespasses, in our sins, we are all dead, but now alive in Christ. So, basically, through Christ, we are alive. That's the only way that that happens. Okay, I'm going to hammer that a lot today, <laughs> but I just need you to know that is like the foundational truth to what Paul is trying to say to anyone who reads this book, right? The only way to be made alive here is through Jesus Christ, right? So as Christians, we should remember where we came from, and we should know what, what we've walked away from, right? What we've turned away from. We should remember who we used to be so that we can see how God saved us. Right? And see how, how different it is now. So we should remember who we were before, before Jesus. But more importantly, we must remember that we were saved from death to life. A lot of people would say, oh, I remember I had so much fun back when. Then I met Jesus and I stopped doing that thing and it was, yeah, it's been good. It's been good. But they look back like the grass was greener. It's just not the truth. We can read um, in Exodus... When the, when the Egyptians are going through, uh, sorry, when they're, when they're leaving, Moses is leading them through the wilderness, and they can't eat, and they can't drink, and they're having to eat manna every day, and there's water from rocks, and they're like, these are amazing gifts from God, but they're like, you saved us so that we could die in the desert? Well, we should go back to slavery, because at least we had food back there. They're not remembering the bad. They're only remembering the food, <laughs> okay? For us, it's really easy sometimes to be tempted to look back on where we came from and be like, actually, it wasn't that bad. It was. It was bad. We are just looking at it in a different light. We're looking at sinful, tainted glasses because we're like, the grass is greener, I promise. It's not. It's not the truth. So we need to remember what we've been saved from as well, from death to life, okay? Through God's work, we are made alive. Through Jesus' blood on the cross, we are made alive. Not through our works, only through Jesus. 
Okay, that's the key thing right there. If you're going to write something down about Ephesians 2, it is through Jesus' blood on the cross. Nothing to do with us. Not our works, not our glory, not our egos, not how good of a person you are, but because of Jesus' blood on that cross. That's how we have been saved. Paul ended the first chapter, which was covered by Brother Scott, um, you showing us that the ultimate example of God's power was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The ultimate show of his glorious power. All the things he did, that resurrection was the ultimate point of it. And now Paul is applying that same resurrection power to our lives, saying Jesus was resurrected from death to life, physically dead. Spiritually for you, physically for you, you can have that same resurrection power in your life, just as Jesus did. You can be saved through that. And the idea, there's a couple of words here, trespasses and sins. Um, we know these words are biblical words, right? But the, the idea behind the word trespasses is that we've crossed a line, right? If you step into someone else's property, what are you doing? Trespassing, right? I've stepped onto someone's lawn. Technically, I'm on their property now. That's trespassing unless I have permission, right? We've crossed the line. We've done something wrong. We've challenged God's boundaries. That's what it's saying here about trespasses in the Bible, right? We're pushing those boundaries. We're stepping beyond where God's put that line in the ground, right? The idea behind the word sins is that we've missed the mark. Archery. Anyone here good at, good at archery? Yeah, you know, so-so. You miss the bullseye every so often? What's that called? It's called a sin. It actually is. That's the, the archery term right there for missing the bullseye, from hitting anywhere else, for missing the mark, is a sin. You miss that whole big target? That's a sin. It counts against you. It's a strike against you, right? That's when people get eliminated from competitions. Three sins and you're out, right? And it's crazy. But just like that, we miss the mark. And the mark is the perfect standard of God, right? It's up here. So, of course, we're going to miss it. But Jesus, right? So, as someone who trespasses, it means we move into territory that is not ours to tread. And if we are followers of Christ, then to trespass would be to walk into the darkness, to literally sin, right? That's the whole point of those words. He's saying, you have he quickened who were dead. Were. You're no longer dead. You were dead in trespasses and sins. They were keeping you down or keeping you from being alive. But actually, you've been made alive in Jesus Christ. You were dead. No longer. Verses 2 and 3, um, it talks about being walking in the ways of the world. One, we once walked in the ways of this world. Where in time past, you walked according to the course of this world. We sin. I sin every day. Right? I live in sin. I trespass every single day. But that's because of the world that we live in. Right? That's because the world is sinful. That's because the way that we have been made through Adam and Eve, causing our first sin in the garden, we've got those people to follow. Sin is in this world, and according to the ways of this world, according to the prince of the power of of the air. Who is the prince of the power of the air? Who has any ideas? Who is that? Oh, but you're on about Satan. Uh, you're on about Satan right there. So, you know, I, I say close, but not even, all right, man? <laughs> the opposite scale. <laughs> but that is, that's one of his names. The prince of this world. The prince of the power of the air. Right? He, that's who we're talking about here. And the spirit they talk about, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The spirit works in the son of disobedience, the daughter of disobedience. This is a talking about those who are in rebellion against God. Yeah, The sons and daughters, the children of disobedience. We've all been a son or a daughter of disobedience. We've all been there, right? At some point in our lives, we've all been there. And as we are all still sinning, we are technically still sons and daughters of disobedience. But the difference is... What does it say in verse 1? Who were dead. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. There's a difference. Something's changed. The difference is that we have Jesus standing in front of us and saving us from the judgment of God. 
He is being that intercessor, that one stepping in between us so that God sees him and not my sin. When I get up to heaven, Jesus is going to stand in front of me and say, I paid for this guy. Sins and all, trespasses and all, disobedience and all is with me. He gets to be here. I'm thankful for that. Because you know, as much as I try to follow Jesus, as much as I try to be a good Christian, I still sin. I still trespass. I'm still a child of disobedience, right? That's the way I am. It's the way the human heart is to rebel. So we've all once walked in darkness, but now with Jesus in our lives, we must walk differently. We must try to at least, right? We need to try to walk differently. Because imagine this, imagine this picture for you. Imagine if you're a dead person. You're dead, you're laying in a coffin. It's pretty comfortable, right? You're not going to feel it because you're dead, but I mean, you're in a coffin and understandably you're happy to be there because you're a dead guy. How would you feel if you uh, weren't dead but you're in a coffin? You're pretty claustrophobic, right? You're closed in, uncomfortable, like you don't want to be there. There would be a strong urge to escape the coffin and leave it behind, right? In the same way, when we were spiritually dead, we feel comfortable in our sins. We feel comfortable in our trespasses, in our coffins. But when we feel like we need to escape, when we come to Christ, we feel the need to escape and to leave all of that behind because Christ is better. Right? The biggest message I got out of Ephesians was don't be dead. Don't think about being dead because you've been made alive. Right? That sounds really funny because it's like, yeah, I've got a pulse. Yeah, I'm breathing. I'm talking to you right now. Clearly, I'm not dead. But there's this reminder of you're not spiritually dead either. You are spiritually alive through Jesus Christ, through the blood on the cross. You've been given new life. I'm thankful for that. It's a new, a new way to live as well, right? So, we've come to Christ. Now we need to feel, we feel the need to escape the coffin and leave it behind because Jesus, paying the price on the cross, has allowed us out of that coffin, out of that death bed, out of that place. And we get the chance to leave the coffin behind. Praise God. We get to turn around and say, no, I'm, I'm with that guy. I have new breath. I have new life in me. I've been given a spirit that tells me I'm not dead. I'm not dead. He says we've lived and we've had, in verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. This idea is like we lived, we conducted ourselves the lust of the flesh. The way we lived, why we lived, why I wanted to live the way I lived, was because it felt good. It felt good. It was a reactionary living instead of an actual thought through, prayed through living. This feels good, so I'm going to do it. I feel good doing this stuff, so I will continue in these ways. There's no conviction. There's no real direction. It's all about your feelings more than actually how you're living. And again, we were once the sons of disobedience, and we've all been dead in the coffin, comfortable. We have embraced the lusts of the flesh, and were by nature children of wrath. Children of wrath, of anger, of despise. That's a couple of different words that different Bibles say there, of anger and of, uh, of despise. And because of all of this, this is us surrendering to the world, being ruled by the devil. That's what's happening. Every time we live in these ways, every time we submit ourselves to the ways of the flesh, we're actually saying to the devil, you win. You win this round. Whereas Jesus is saying, stop putting a foot back in the coffin, man. You're alive. Breathe. Live like you're alive. Don't be dead. Don't be spiritually dead. Don't be going backwards. Move forwards. But humans, we're really good at stepping backwards and being like, actually, I really liked it backwards. Grass was greener when I was getting hit by whips, but at least I had food in my belly. It's a bigger picture here, guys, right? Yeah. And I, I want to tell you, I've lived a very lustful life. I drank a lot. I 
I've smoked a lot, I've done a lot of drugs, I've done a lot of fighting. I've done a lot of things that the body longs for, but it's not healthy. And at that moment in time, it's like, yeah, it feels really good to be able to do these things. Boom, connecting with a good right hook. That feels great. Until the next morning when you can't move your fingers. Hey, I drank so many beers that night. I feel great. Until the next morning you wake up and you can't see straight and you've got this horrible headache. I don't know what happened last night, but it felt great. No, it's not great. It's not healthy. And what Jesus is saying here is do not give in to the the lusts of your flesh, of this world, right? Look to Jesus instead. Look to him instead. Because truthfully, we deserve, we rightfully deserve the wrath of God because of the sin in our lives and in our hearts. We deserve it because of who we are and because of the sin in this world. A couple of uh, verses for you here, Matthew 3, 7. Matthew 12, 34, and Matthew 23, 33, all in Matthew, right? This is specifically Jesus calling the Pharisees a family of snakes. Why would he call them that? Because they are people who are feeding the lusts of their body, of the world, and living that way, right? They were calling a brood of vipers in some some Bibles as well. And John 8, 44 tells us that the father of these snakes is... The devil. We are children of God. Once we accept God as Father, but in truth, we start as part of a family of snakes. That's where we start. Until you've accepted God as your Father, you're like a snake. You're in a brood of vipers living lustfully instead of living for God. Right? Verse 4, though. Here's the good news, already good news. Verse 4 starts right there. But God. But God. What a part of scripture that right there is, right? It's not even a whole sentence, it's two words. But God. We were dead because of our sins. But God. That's good news. We were separated because of the weight of such sin in our lives. But God. But God. We were children of the world with no hope but God, again. And we have no right to look at the throne of God but God. That thing saying that however far away we came, God still was there. But God still was there, right? And God, rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross so that we can be in relationship with him. Romans Road um, is all the way through every single chapter of Ephesians. I'm not going to touch on it as an actual slide tonight, but I need you to know that everything we talk about is about redemption, is about joining into God's family, is about admitting that we were sinners, saved by God's grace, not by our own works, but by his. And actually saying, I believe in my heart, I confess with my mouth that Jesus is king. He raised himself from the dead. He rose from the dead. And then we say, right? That's throughout this whole book. Every single chapter points to that. And this moment here, but God, that whilst we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. God stepped in. But God stepped in whilst we were yet sinners. Then God stepped in. Redemption story. Rescue story. Praise God. I'm thankful for that redemption story, right? So the good news of God's salvation offered in Jesus is this exact thing. The fact that his mercy and love is extended to us. But God didn't give up. But God still extended that gift. Even when we were rejected and rejected and rejected. But God kept that hand out and said, keep knocking. Keep knocking. I'm going to be right here waiting for you. But God did not give up. Right? Praise God for that. This love that was extended to us is nothing to do with us. I told you I was going to hammer on this. We are not worthy to get into heaven. We are sinners. We are not good. Right? There's not good inside of us. The only good that we have 
It's because of Jesus. Yeah, but I'm a really nice guy. Well, good for you, man. It's not good enough. Yeah, but I give a lot of money to charity. Good for you, man. That ain't going to get you to heaven. A lot of people get confused about that. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. God's love is so great that it extends even to the unlovely, to the children of wrath. That's who we were if we, before we accepted Jesus. So every reason for God's mercy and love is found in him, not in us. Every reason is from him, right? We give him no reason to love us, yet, but God, again, you know, the greatness of his love, he loves us with that great love anyway, even how bad we are. God's great grace and love for us is simply not understandable for us. We can't wrap our heads around it. And I think that's the kind of crazy thing. I struggle with grace, this idea of grace still. Like, I've been a Christian, what, since I was 15? I'm 34 now, it's 19 years. I still struggle with this idea that God is saying, I'm going to give you this gift even though you don't deserve it. It is great grace. It is not understandable in any way, shape, or form, because humans just do not understand that love. Our version of love is so watered down compared to what God has for us. Verses 5 to 7, it says again, even when we were dead in sins, in our trespasses, you have quickened us together with Christ. This is kind of like a rep repetition of verse 1, but the difference is here, he's saying, you, you were dead in sins in verse 1 right there, and in verse 5 it says, even when we were dead in sins. So it's, it's slightly different, but now he's saying, but in Christ, with Christ. And it says, by grace ye are saved. By grace you're saved. By this gift you are saved, with Jesus though, and not on your own. The only way you can be saved, again, with Jesus, with Christ. And even when we were dead in trespasses, dead in our sins, that's when God still loved us. God still saw us and said, you know what, whilst you're still sinners, whilst you're still doing all these bad things, whilst you're still thinking those bad thoughts, I'm still going to send my son Jesus Christ for you. By God's grace, we are able to accept that gift. By God's grace, that gift was even sent. That's the amazing thing about this. When we were still sinning, he did not wait till we were lovable, because that would never happen, right? Or even when we were good enough. Because remember, God's mark is up here, ours is barely scraping the surface, right? We're just not good enough. He loved us even when we were dead in our sins. Uh, John 5, 24, we're going to jump to there very quickly. Um, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me have everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from what? From death unto life. I'll read that again very quickly. Verily, verily, truly, truly, right? That's what Jesus is saying here. I say to you, he that heareth my voice, if you hear my words right now and believe upon him that sent me, you have everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. That is God's grace. John 5, 24. Check it out. Read it again. Pray about it. What does that mean to you? It means that if you believe in Jesus, there is no condemnation for you now. He is going to stand in front of you. He's going to take all those sins off of your shoulders. And you will have, what? New life. You will pass from death. Like you'd have been given a new breath of life. That's good news. That's the gospel right there. Believing, confessing, accepting, and moving forward with Jesus. Right? It's good news. And this is the requirement of being saved, right? The requirement of being saved. You must first understand that you're dead. You must first understand that our sins have consequences to every attempt to justify ourselves before God. We can't justify ourselves before God because we're just not worthy. 
We wouldn't have even made it into that throne room. You need to understand that. That we have, Even if you think you're the most cleanest person in the whole world, if you'd stepped behind that, that big long curtain back in the Old Testament, and you would have said, I'm clean, squeaky clean, no sin right here. We would have stepped through there, boom, and been struck down. Because everyone says, everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. You know that. Romans tells us that. Okay? We're all sinners. We're all coming from a place of death. Jesus has given us new life. Okay. So we must accept that we're sinful, dead to sin, that we are lost. That's a tough place to start. That's a tough place, a tough thing to accept. But that the truth is we must accept that we all need Jesus. That's the easiest part to understand. You know what? I'm lost. I need help. I'm lost. I need a savior. I'm lost. I need a king. Jesus is right there. And from that, be passed from death, from sin, from the trespasses of this world, into life. Life in Jesus and through Jesus Christ. Okay. We are made alive together with Christ. That is what God did to those who were dead in sin. That's what God did to us. I have been made alive through Christ Jesus. The blood on the cross has given me new life. Right? He shared in our death so that we could share in his resurrection life. That's a really cool thing to think about. Jesus had it all. He didn't need to come down. Jesus had a real nice comfy throne, I'm sure about it, up in heaven. He didn't need to come down. He did. Grace. He lowered himself. Right, That first selfless act. Then he went to the cross. Dying so that we don't have to die. Dying so that our sins could be taken care of. <clears throat> so by grace, you have been saved. That's the end of verse 5 right there. Our salvation is the work of God's grace. In no way our works. In no way anything to do with us. It's all to do with God's grace. Our salvation, our rescue from spiritual death is God's work done for the undeserving. We don't deserve this gift. Don't deserve it. But just like my seven and nine year old at Christmas time, they get gifts. I'm going to buy them Christmas presents because I'm their dad and I love them, right? I'm not going to be that jerk that's like, no, actually, you're just not good enough. I'm not going to give you gifts. But whilst we were sinning, whilst we were in that pigsty of sin, rolling around in all that mud, head to toe covered, God sent the greatest gift down for all of us. We just have to accept it. And again, just like my seven and nine year old when it comes to Christmas, that, that present will barely even touch their hands. And it's ripped open and it's like, oh, I want to play with it, whatever it is. I want to build the Lego set. I want to play with the Pokemon cards. That gift is being offered to all of us. Life through Jesus Christ. It's up to you to accept it. Up to you. I can't force you to accept it. I want you to. I want you to accept it. But the whole point is that's up to you. That's up to you guys to make that decision. But because of God's grace, is that even offered? That's the best part. And because of that, because of the salvation that's offered, we get the incredible opportunity, by God's amazing grace, to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's verse 6 for you right there. And this is the position of the Christian, right? The upgrade from our life of death is to sit with Jesus, in Christ Jesus, right? We have a new place for living, a new dwelling place, opposed to the old dwelling place, which was death. Revelation talks of those who dwell on earth, and it talks kind of sadly about them and what will happen to them. But instead, our citizenship is in heaven, as Philippians 3.20 tells us. You're not made for this world, you're a citizen of heaven instead, Philippians 3.20. And check out the words here in verse 6. It says, And have raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We don't sit in the heavenly places with Jesus. Not quite yet, right? Instead, we sit in heavenly places in Jesus. Our life and identity is in Christ. As he sits in the heavenly places, at the right hand of the Father, so do we, only through him. It gets kind of confusing, right? 
But that's the point. Jesus has taken our spot. He's taken our sin, our shame, died for us so that we can be in that presence. So only through the fellowship of Jesus can we even do these things. Verses 8 to 10. For by grace you have been saved. Are you saved through faith? Paul again reminding us of the glorious work God has done, which is all down to grace. Which is given to the undeserving. We are not even saved by our faith but in fact by grace through faith. See, the funny thing is, you think about grace, and you're like, oh, I'll accept that gift. But unless you actually believe in that gift, then you're just taking something, and you're not actually putting it into practice. And then if you have belief in something, but it's never been offered, well, then you're believing in nothing, because it's not been offered. What has to happen here is there has to be grace, and there has to be faith comes together. That's your salvation. Okay? Different uh, uh, little... Uh, uh, illustration for you. Think about it like this. Think of water and a hose. You attach it to the faucet, you turn the faucet on. What, is, what happens? That water gets transported by the hose to get to where it needs to be, right? The hose on its own does not quench your thirst. The hose on its own is just a hose, right? The water in the pipes needs to get to that other place. will not do that unless very, very slowly flooding, maybe. I don't know. But think about that. The hose brings the water to the place where you can benefit from it. Like that, grace and faith also does that. Your faith isn't enough, but there's this grace that's the transporter, right? It's the in-between saying, this gift, your faith, come together, know God. Right? It's the connector offered by God to allow us God's grace is free, undeserved favor to mankind. God's grace. The work of salvation is God's gift. Salvation is God's gift. Even our faith is God's gift as well. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 tells us more about that as well. It's all a gift from God. Because we wouldn't have thought about it on our own. You notice that in the Bible when you read about certain character, uh, certain people and they say, ah, I don't know God, I don't know God, and I don't need to talk about Pharaoh, and you talk about Moses, who's doing these amazing works, showing him signs and wonders from God, and he's like, I don't know him. That's because he hasn't been given the gift of faith. You've got to know that. If you've been given the gift of faith, you have to accept that, and grace also. And we are God's handiworks, his workmanship. Verse 10 here. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship, his hand, handiwork, right? We are being transformed by God. Because before I was a person of this world, and now I am not. Before I liked this thing, now I like this thing. But you know what happens in between? There's a transformation. God's love enters in. And it changes us. And it changes how we live. It changes how we treat people. It changes how you look at life. It truly does change you. So God's love is a transformational love. And it meets us. This is the best part about it as well. Again, grace. It meets us wherever we are. It meets us wherever we're at. I remember one night, and I just needed help, and I needed help back in Andover, and I was, I'd just been in a fist fight. I had a bloody nose. I had a busted up lip, I was in the middle of a graveyard and I had this big fight with this guy and I was covered in mud, my jeans were ripped, my shirt was real messy, and I had been drinking a fair bit, and you know what, I thought, I'm going to go to the church, I'm going to ask for help. And I walked in there and I didn't have a good experience, but you know what I was looking for? I was looking for God. And that's God's grace reaching out to us at our lowest point, saying, you know what, I'm here for you. And there's been times in my life I can turn around and say, I needed God, who showed up. I needed God, and things happened. And that person helped me at that time. And this situation changed because I prayed. You know, and there's moments where you can be like, God stepped in and changed things for me. God meets us where we are. At our lowest, at our highest, at our wherever we are. He comes and he finds us. No one's out of bounds for God. He will come and find us. If we're willing and we've got the right heart, he'll come. 
And the great thing about it is when we receive this love, it takes us where we should be going. And that's towards Him. It takes us from wherever we are, and it changes us and it points us in the right direction. The love of God that saves my soul will also change my life. It's a nice quote. I enjoy kind of saying that. Love of God that saves my soul will also change my life. It's not about a once saved and then you're happy and you're happy and you're all good to go. There's a change that happens afterwards. It's a transformation. Okay. So we've got section two. Brought near by his blood. Verses 11 through to 13. Um, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus ye have sometimes been far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You, Gentiles of the flesh, you were once Gentiles of the flesh. It's verse 11 then. In the past, in, the, in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, right? Jews and Gentiles are reachable. This is what I'm getting from this that section right here. God can reach even those you don't expect. God's work of reconciliation is not only between God and the individual, it can reach groups of people that we can, can't even understand. Because this is the point, right? Jews, they're meant to know God. Remember back in those times, Jews were meant to be the, God's chosen people. So why would God want to meet Gentiles? Because Gentiles were considered aliens. They were considered strangers, having no hope, and being without God. Why would you want to reach those guys when you've got your chosen people here? And what, what Paul's saying is everyone can be reached. Everyone. Before coming to Christ, Gentiles were Christless, stateless, friendless, hopeless, and godless. Right? That's what Spurgeon said. And it's that idea of being like, they had nothing. They had nothing. They were without hope, without God, without Christ. And with that meant they were without spiritual blessings. They were about light in this dark world. They were about peace. They were about rest. Rest. They were about safety. Without hope. Without a prophet, a priest, or a king. They didn't, they didn't have anything. In verse 13 it says, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. This is, again, the gospel moment here. Those Gentiles who are now in Christ Jesus. Something's changed. Gentiles who are far off. You can't be friends with those guys. You can't be close to those guys. Why would God want to save those guys? Well, guess what? Now you're in Christ Jesus. You're saved. They were made near to the things of God. And the blood of Christ accomplished this through his death on the cross. Are made nigh by the blood. Guys, we're Gentiles. I wasn't a Jew. I wasn't a Jew. I was a Gentile. I was of this world. I was living a, a lustful, flesh, flesh, fleshly life, right? I was a Gentile. You were a Gentile. Yet through the blood of Jesus, we are brought close to him. What an amazing thing to think about. The blood of Jesus brought us close. By the blood of Christ... Those Gentiles have given new life, new identity, new hope, light in their life instead of darkness, a king, a priest, a God, right? And people, again, they think they can come to Christ in different ways, but truly the only way is through the blood. People think being a good person, being charitable, by keeping the law, or belonging to a certain people group, Right? I've heard that before. Like, well, I'm a Jew, so I'm going to get into heaven. And I'm like, well, do you, do you know Jesus? No, no, but I'm a Jew. And my dad was a Jew. And we've always been Jews. And I'm like, well, great. But do you know Jesus? Because that's the only way this works. Through the blood. 
Not through your people group, not through what your ID says about you, but through Jesus. What Jesus did on the cross, suffering as a guilty sinner in the place of guilty sinners, is the only thing that brings us close to God, that acceptance of that sacrifice. Section 3, Christ our peace, verses 14 through 18. For he is our peace, who have brought, made both one and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And he that might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity therefore, and came and preached peace to you which were far afar off, and to them that were nigh. Verse 18, for thou, for, so for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Christ our peace. For he himself is our peace. Jesus is our peace. Jesus himself is peace, right? He hasn't just simply walked in between us and God and said, everyone good? You happy? You happy? Everyone peaceful? No more anger, no more aggression, no more war? No, Jesus is our peace in that time, in that place, in our lives, right? He made peace between God and man. He made peace between Jew and Gentile. He is our peace. Jesus is the ultimate peacemaker in the situation, right? In our lives. The work of Jesus on the cross is the common ground of salvation for both Jew and Gentile. Therefore, there is no longer a divide. The amazing thing about this, this whole situation right here, as Paul's writing this book, a little bit of context for you, he is under house arrest. He's under house arrest. Why? For being accused of, by Jews, for bringing, for taking a Gentile past the dividing wall. Now, what you'd realize back in those days in the temples, there was a wall straight down the middle. And it would be more than 30, 70 maybe. But basically, Gentiles, you go this side. Jews, you go this side. No Gentiles allowed to go on the Jew side, right? Out of bounds, forbidden. Don't even think about it. And the Jews have accused Paul and said, he did it. He brought a Gentile back here. Arrest him. So he's under house arrest for literally bringing a guy through and showing that this dividing wall means nothing. You're all, you're all worshipping the same God. But he's under house arrest, writing this letter. And Paul, but Paul has made it clear that in Jesus, the wall is gone. There is no longer a divide, right? The wall is gone because the Lord is greater than any divide that we can create. Anything that we put in between, God is greater. Any wall that we can build up, God is taller. Anything that we think is strong enough to keep him out, well, guess what? God is mightier. We cannot stop that. We cannot divide. God is the ultimate peacemaker, but also he will break down his walls and be like, I'm going to save everybody. The biggest issue between Jews and Gentiles was that the Gentiles did not tend to keep the law. They tend to kind of break it a little bit, you know? Jews were really strict. No, this is the way to do it. Gentiles are like, man, nah, what, what law? Why would, I even, why would I obey the law when I don't believe in a God? Makes sense. But that was the whole point. The Jews would pick up on that and be like, well, why, why, would you, why would you be saved? Why would you be saved if you're not going to keep God's law? But, so Jesus fulfilled the law on all of our behalf. Right? He stepped into the fold. He fulfilled the law. And Jesus bore the penalty for our failures to keep the law. And praise God. We are reconciled through Jesus' work on the cross. And this reconciliation brings together Jew and Gentile, which is part of God's greater plan. That was uh, taught through by Scott again in Ephesians 1.10. It's a preview of what God has planned, of everyone coming together and worshipping him. No separation, no divide. Verses 17 and 18 uh, it talks about you being afar off, verse 17, and came and preached peace to you which were far off, afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. So when you are far away, and to those of you near, I preach the same message. And this is what we talked about 
when Jesus uh, continually talked about the gospel, pointing people to God, it never changed. Whoever was in front of them, he told them the truth. He spoke the truth. So the same peace that is preached to those far off, the Gentiles, right, is preached to those who are near, the Jews. You both get the same message. You both get the same opportunity. You both treat the same. And maybe the Jews are a little bit upset about that. Yeah, but we've been doing what we can to follow you, and these guys have just been doing what they want. It doesn't matter. God loves you, God loves them. The same message, the same opportunity, the same peace is being preached to them. You will enjoy the same access to God, access that comes by one spirit to the Father, right? Saved by the, saved by the same gospel, access to the same God, no one is treated differently. You're part of the family. No favoritism here. You won't have different access. What's he saying in verse 18 here? For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. It doesn't say the Jews get better. It doesn't say the Gentiles get better. It says we both have access. And that's the great truth right there. We can all have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ to the Father because of what happened on the cross. Section uh, 4, verses 19 to 22, Christ, our cornerstone. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, Verse 22, in whom ye also are builded together for an inhabitation of God through the Spirit. Great news. You were once Jews, you were once Gentiles. Now, you are no longer strangers or foreigners. You are no longer second-class citizens. You are full citizens, but equal citizens as well. That's an amazing thing. Forget your identity on this earth. Citizens of heaven. Built on the foundations of apostles and prophets, we are now one body that has been built up because of who laid the foundations in this, the Bible, right? The apostles, the disciples, the prophets, those people who wrote truth and truth have laid a foundation for all of us now to follow. And that's the, that's the amazing thing about the Bible. It has been tested. It has been tested. It has been tested again, Right? Yet it stands up. Yet it holds true. And it still applies to our lives. And that's because the apostles that went before, the prophets that went before, spoke truth. No exaggeration. There's no lies. Just truth. And that's why it stands up. And that's the foundation that we have to live now as Christians. We have the foundation of truth. So the foundation is now set. We have a blueprint to follow. Right? We have a way to follow this. And in this foundation, there is Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. And this refers to the capstone. Anyone know what a capstone is? Or a binding stone? It's basically the stone that holds the whole structure together. It's the most important one. It's the one you place, knowing it needs to be in a good position, strong enough, and ready to take all the weight of the rest of the building. It's the start of that foundation, right? And the amazing thing about it is, back in those days, back in Roman days as well, they used to do this, when they placed down that capstone, that cornerstone, they would put a print, they would chisel in the royal mark into the stone to make sure people knew who laid, who built this building, under whose reign, under, under whose rule would have this building been put into place. And this one, it was Jesus Christ, cornerstone, right? In this cornerstone, the whole building is joined together. That's what it says. As we are followers of Jesus, as we keep to our common foundation of the truth, the word of God, the whole building of God's people grow together in a beautiful way. That's what it says here, right? Unto a holy temple in the Lord. That's verse 21. As a holy temple. Where God dwells in beauty and in glory. The church is a building designed by a great architect, by God. But we know that the church isn't just a building. It's not just 
this thing that we're in right now. It's a nice, nice building for sure, but this isn't the building we're talking about. The building is the coming together of God's people, right? The actual church itself is not important. God's not looking and being like, wow, the counters at Spokane Baptist Church have a really nice. The paint job they did right here is fantastic. No, he's saying, what's the church, my people? What does that look like? Are they building on a foundation that was started by Jesus Christ or by something else? I hope that when God looks down at Spokane Baptist Church, he looks and he says, these guys are building their foundation off of the foundation of right, not of something else, right? But the best part about all of this, God is in the midst of it. Verse 21 says, in, in whom all the building fitly, fitly framed together grow unto a holy temple in the Lord. Verse 22, in whom ye also are built together for an inhabitation of God through the Spirit. We're not just a people group coming together now. We have a purpose. What's the purpose? To inhabit the Spirit of God. We have a reason, a mission to be here to take the gospel to other people, to tell them about the truth of Jesus Christ, but to also come together and have the Spirit of God in us, an inhabitation. That's an amazing thing. What, what a mission to have, right? Guys, that tells me that we have a purpose on this earth. A purpose, a mission given by God. And that is Ephesians Chapter 2, I've got three final points for you right here. Again, there they are. So verse one, uh, first point one, Jesus' blood has paid the ultimate price. Do you accept it? Do you accept that he did that? Do you accept that it's true? Do you have any doubts? Because if you do, we need to talk about it. But more importantly, you need to talk to Jesus about it. Right? Second point, God's Grace has provided salvation through the cross. Do we accept that? We were sinners, saved by God's grace. How is it? How have we been saved? Jesus coming down, dying on the cross, taking our sins and shames on his shoulders so that we don't have to die a sinner's death. Do we accept that gift? Do we accept that it was true? Again, if you have any doubts, Talk to Jesus. Talk to us about it, but talk to Jesus about it. Read your Bibles. Understand that what you're reading is truth. And third point, God has given us a new identity. You're feeling second rate? You're feeling like a foreigner? You're feeling like an alien? I've got a green card in America. I'm not a citizen yet. But you know where I am a citizen? That's in heaven. I have a new identity because of Jesus Christ. How I live here. I'm living like I'm a citizen of heaven instead. Do we accept that new identity that God has given us? Do you accept that Jesus' blood has paid the ultimate price? Do you accept that God's grace is the ultimate gift? Do you accept that new identity in your life? Guys, that's Ephesians uh, chapter 2.